So dear friends, colleagues and seniors from, from Romania and, and across the world, uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for joining this Ophthalmology Foundation uh, initiative webinar on, on teaching in ophthalmology. And it's my pleasure to discuss on this a very challenging, kind of a dicey topic called as teaching in a busy clinic. Um, so I was very happy that Dr. Eduardo rolled out the question on who the audience is. And I, and I was very happy and surprised that almost half of them are residents or trainees. Is that right, Dr. Eduardo? Yes, that's yeah, right. That, that's fantastic. So we have students with us. So we have the future teachers with us. So I think this is going to be a great learning experience for the teachers as well as for the learners. Because I strongly believe that a learner should engage in teaching as much as possible. And, and that's the way we move forwards towards creating the best possible generation of teachers in the future. So I would strongly recommend the audience, the trainees, fellows, the surgeons, and the trainers to please enroll in our Ophthalmology Foundation Teaching Skills course. It's completely free of cost to enroll, and it's a certified course. So once you engage or enroll in this course, you will, you will be having a long list of lectures, engaging activities. And this particular talk is featuring in module number four on teaching and assessing in clinic. So today I will be focusing on the teaching aspect. How can we teach? Then the assessing aspect, which will be dealt later by Dr. Gabriela. So the objectives of today's talk is gonna be these things. First, we want the audience to describe the principles of teaching in a busy clinic. So we can go this together by the end of this talk. We should be also able to employ certain strategies which we can use in clinical teaching. The third is we will be able to differentiate between good and a bad practices in clinical teaching by certain examples. Right. So those are the objectives which we'll try to attain by the end of this talk. But before that, let's answer some questions to ourselves. The first question is why should we teach in a busy clinic? What's the purpose? What's the reason? And we'll see why not we teach in a busy clinic. The second is who? Who is the audience we are trying to teach? The third is going to be the how, the techniques of teaching in a busy clinic. And finally, what are the content of, of teaching? What are we supposed to teach to the students? Uh, the big chunk of this lecture, of, of, of this talk, is going to be focused on the how aspect of it, the techniques, which are going to be the more practical hacks or tips, which I can provide from my experience on how we can teach in a busy clinic. So let's answer the first question, why? What is the purpose of teaching in a busy clinic. I mean, we all know why. That is, there is no reason for me to convince the audience that we have to teach in a busy clinic. Uh, it is the gold standard of teaching clinical medicine. Even the best possible lectures cannot replace the real world experience clinical teaching offers. Because for one reason, for one simple fact, the clinical skills can never ever be transferred in a clinic, in a in a classroom setting. Nobody can teach skills in a classroom. You can teach the theory, but you can't really demonstrate with the patients in a classroom, can we? And that's evident from the adult learning principles as well, which was dealt by Professor Helena. We adults learn from case scenarios. And one thing is adult learning is problem-centered. It is a problem-based learning. And it's not only the clinical skills or the hard skills, but also it's going to be the soft skills, which is quite underrated. As trainee, as, as fellow, or as, or as resident, it is important for us to learn how are we communicating with the patient. And we learn that art of communication, the science of communication, from watching a tutor, from watching a teacher, or a model doing that with the patient. right? So skills such as empathy, compassion, they can't be transferred by lectures. They have to be seen. And this is a eye opener for me, actually, no pun intended, but this was this was a beautiful, beautiful uh, slide uh, model proposed by Professor Harden. The 12 roles of a medical teacher. We all think that as doctors, our primary goal is to just teach, means go to a classroom, just teach students. So a doctor is or a medical teacher is more than just an information provider. He's also a role model. He's more than a lecturer. He's also a clinical teacher. He's a teaching role model. He's the on-the-job role model. And we also learned from Professor Helena's talk that there are other reasons why or what compress of being a medical teacher. So now I've convinced you, I think you're already convinced that we should teach in a busy clinic for sure. But we do have some challenges. In other words, why not do we engage in teaching in a, in a busy clinic? Um, I just want to 
hear from the esteemed audience, what is your biggest challenge in teaching students in clinic? So please answer all that apply. Is it lack of time? Is it lack of appropriate teaching skills? Or is it a lack of adequate space or ambience for you? Pranesh, are you seeing the questions coming in? Yes, Dr. Bhatt. The answers See. coming, okay. I wanted to check that because Elena had some trouble. I have to work that out. You just That's let good. me know when you want me to end the poll. Yeah, I think we got 21 responses and I think, yes, we can end it yet. Okay. Thank you so much. So the results, yeah, I can see the results now. And yes, you are right. 70% uh, age, 75% of the audience have felt that the lack of time in a busy clinic is, is the reason why you can't teach. Of course, it's going to be a busy clinic, which means that is going to be a time constraint. Great answer. That's what the answer, you know, answer which I was expecting. Okay. Uh, lack of appropriate teaching skills. Yes, few felt that. Of course, you are right. You need to kind of fine tune, you need to kind of limit yourself uh, when you teach in a clinic. We will see. We will try to answer all those challenges in a minute. Uh, lack of adequate space. Excellent. Great. Yes, we do. We do have very small cubicles or OPD clinic. We don't really have a large classroom like atmosphere to teach. Excellent. Thanks for that. So I have uh, yet another question because these I've just given only three uh, multiple, you know, three options. But do you think that you have any other challenges? So you can answer this open-ended question in the Q&A box. What are the challenges do you face while teaching the students in a clinic? Apart from the previous options, such as lack of time, lack of appropriate teaching skills, or lack of space. Yes, you can answer through the, through the window that opened, preferably. But if you don't find the window, then use the Q&A. So, mm, right. Not seeing much of answers. If if, well, if there are any uh, at, the, at this time, because they have to write answers, will be right. entering. Right. It's going to be some time. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I can end the poll at any time, and we can check here first, and then I'll go look into that. Okay, I will close the poll. Thanks. Dr. Share results, view details. Ah, this you you have to click on view details to see. Right, I'm not able to uh, okay. see the. Okay, I I'll, I'll let you know that we've got the answers we forgot through the um, here is uh, I don't I don't I don't know how efficient to see the results confidentiality of examination, lack of previous wet lab experience, patient's agreement. And let, let me go to Q&A and see if any questions came in there. Um, Q&A, I close here. No, none of the answers came in through Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adwari. So like, uh, like the others? Pranesh, sorry. Now we have the gray square. No, I'll stop sharing. Can you, uh, can we uh, close this box? I'm not able to close the... I, let me see. I've closed all the boxes. But let me go back to... You need to hide the floating panel. It's a yeah, but it's, it's in the good. it's in the list at the bottom of the of the screen. Able to uh get this thing rid of. Would you want to stop sharing and share again? 
Yeah, yeah, now I think I can. Yeah. Now? Excellent. I think now it should be fine. Yep. Great. All right. So like the audience who have, who have taken the pain to, to kind of answer uh, why, uh, what are the challenges they face? Like you guys rightly have mentioned, the patient confidentiality is going to be one thing and, 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 the, and the lack of space and uh, the lack of practice, the, the previous knowledge the student has, all these also are going to be challenges we're going to face. Great. So you'll try to understand those challenges and they can be overcome one by one when we understand who our audience is. And that's going to be the second question you want to answer. Who are we teaching? So unlike a classroom, there is an extra member in the dynamics of the clinical teaching. We're going to have a preceptor or a teacher or a doctor. We have a student, but we also have a patient now. So it's going to be a complex dynamics, right? So I just want to understand about the audience. Who do you teach in the clinic? I know uh, we have residents, we have trainees here, but if at all you teach in your clinic, so if you can answer... Uh, Dr. Eduardo. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Edward, you're, you're muted. I'm sorry. I just left my desk for a moment. I will open now in a minute. So you can answer all that apply. If you want to teach an undergraduate or postgraduate or, or, or all of these three categories, nurses, optometrists. Yeah. Pose. This one is, what do you teach? Blanche. Yeah, yeah. Okay, there it is. Okay. Okay, everybody's answering. Okay, I close the poll. Share results. Can you see the results? Finish? Yes. Yes. So we have got an equal balance of undergraduate students as well as postgraduate students and, and the lesser proportion of nurse or optometrists. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for that. That is that is uh, excellent because we really want to know uh, who you are teaching so that the, the audience is going to be very important because see from this picture that uh, depending upon who the audience is, the, the level or the frequency is going to shift. That's going to play a huge role, actually. Uh, so what we teach uh, actually is going to be dependent on who we are teaching in the first place. So these questions are important. So who they are? Are they undergraduates? Are they postgraduates? Are they are they nurses or optometrists? Um, do we know them? Do we know them already? Have have you taught them before? See, in my current role as a, as a, as a teaching fellow, uh, on Monday mornings, what I do is I take classes for my trainees, for my undergraduate students. That's on the Monday. And I see them again in my clinic. So now I know what I have taught them previously. Now it gives me a chance for me to re-engage with them. Now I try to connect my theory with applied aspects. So do you have that luxury of seeing the students again? Or the students do kind of barge inside all of a sudden? That's a question which we want to answer. And, and uh, uh, how often do we teach them? Do we see them every day? Do we see them once in a week? Do we get a chance to see them again so that we can assess their progression? That's another question to have in mind. So all these things, depending upon who the audience is, we will come to an understanding of what to teach or what is their expected curriculum that we have to tell them. So this is going to be the crucial thing. So now I saw that we have two equal proportions. We have undergraduates, we have postgraduates, the audience of uh, who we teach. Now this is one of the to-do lists which I made for my residents back in Aravind. So these are postgraduates. When they come to one particular uh, specialty, such as uveitis, I give them this week-wise to-do list. So they have to know, know, they have to do all these steps. So every week they have a very clear uh, laid out objectives or a plan. 
And for the undergraduate students at Moofields who come from different universities, we give them so-called Q cards. It's like an online application. So students go there and they, when they want to go to a particular specialty, for example, they want to go to a medical retina clinic, they have these very set to-do lists. They have to discuss the science of DR, they have to talk to a patient, they have to get the visual acuity, then goes to the cataract clinic, they have to do only these things. So it's a very set very clearly laid out expectations from the students. That's important. That's that's the duty of the educator, duty of the medical teacher, clinical teacher, to set clear learning objectives. Now, please watch this video and let me know your thoughts in the Q&A box. You may have some subtitles in, in, uh, in other language, so please don't worry about that. How you doing? My name's Alan. I'm a medical student. I'll be working with you today. Hey, Alan. Um, well, I have a really busy clinic today, and um, I'm not really sure how much you're going to get out of it, but um, well, okay. Let's get started. Okay. So I hope the audio was clear to the audience and uh, he is the doctor and we have a student who has come to introduce himself to the doctor. So what are your thoughts? You can put in the Q&A box. Yes, I, 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 about thoughts, if this means, uh, was this good? Could the doctor have done a better introduction? That, that what is what, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts? What do you, what do you infer from that video? This is my inference from the video. So do we have any answers, uh, Dr. Edward? Uh, yes, here Dr. Stanka says, not very friendly, welcome. Um, here another one that says, unfortunately, it's a familiar setting. And that is, I think only Dr. Stanka referred to this. So yes, uh, I think it was it was it was quite obvious from that bit of a not a great welcoming uh, thing. So the doctor's priority uh, was how to cross this busy clinic than the teaching. So his priority was oh my god, not another student today. I I want to see the patients as early as possible. I want to get this busy clinic done. I don't want another student to come and interrupt my flow of patients, which is which is quite a common thought which will come across to every doctor who is practicing in a clinic. I totally empathize with those teachers who. Uh, or doctors who, who don't really have enough time to uh, to teach in a busy clinic. Um, but 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 let's understand, look at this video, please. Hi, my name's Alan. I'm a medical student. I'll be working with you today. Hey, Alan, welcome. You had a chance to spend a little bit of time on the ophthalmology rotation? Just a little bit, yeah. Okay. What kind of things would you like to accomplish with this day? Well, I plan on going into internal medicine, so I might like to learn some of the presenting symptoms of some common problems. Okay, great. Have you had any chance to work with the slip lamp at all? Uh, just very little, very okay. little. Good. Well, how's this sound for a plan? Why don't we uh, really focus on the history and get a good history of present illness, and then also I'd like you to work on your presenting skills. So after you get a chance to go in and see the patient and get the history, have you come out and present to me. The other thing I think is be worthwhile for you to spend some time focusing on the slip lamp exam. And so what I would hope to accomplish by the end of the day is to have a, a good sense of some of the more common presenting symptoms and then have you feel real comfortable using this slip lamp. How's that sound? That sounds great. Okay, good. Let me show you a little bit about the slip lamp and some of the features. Okay. The other thing I, I wanted to mention um, is that during the day it, it gets pretty hectic and sometimes we don't have as much time as we'd like to talk about each patient. So if you have any particular interest or questions, go ahead and jot them down. And then at the end of the day, we'll come back and address each one of those. Okay. Great. Good. Great. So now this is a different video of, of the same scenario. So I would like to hear your thoughts now. What do you think uh, has changed? Do you think things have got improved? Do you think things have got bad? Please let me know your thoughts in the Q&A box.
Can you see what is going in, uh, Panesh, to the Q&A? Um, no, Dr. Eduardo, I've, I've, I've hidden my floating control, so um, I need to find a way to bring that back. But, but can, can you, you see it? Yes, I can see it. Yeah, can you please? It says, you know? yes, yes, it says definite improvement, trying to know about the student and set goals. Brilliant. Then, let me see. The doctor was interested in the student's background knowledge. He set some clear objectives and warned the students about the lack of time with honesty. Then, explaining the objectives and the motivation has the meaning to properly involve the students. Excellent. Great, great observations. Thank you so much, uh, you know, guys, for kind of answering this, taking trouble in putting your thoughts in the Q&A box. So you are right. I mean, this was the exact thoughts which I had, actually. It's a totally different scenario. And here the teacher asks what the student wants to gain. So the, the teacher wants to know about the student's expectations. And he also suggests a clear plan for the student as well. So he's also giving, why can't we do this? Because he knows that there is going to be some restraints and he wants to try to give the best possible learning experience for our student. Good. So now... We have covered a little bit on, on the student. We have, we, we have finished the doctor-student interaction. Now let's move on to another audience. Uh, in fact, when I meant who, it's not just about the student, but it's also about the patient. Who is going to be the patient? Now let's switch our focus on the patient. Like we already discussed, bringing a patient into the picture kind of changes the dynamics because now the priority is going to be the patient for a doctor, not going to be the student. And never it's going to be uh, more for the student. Maybe the doctor might try to hit the balance between keeping the priority and equally on the patient and on the student. But uh, I don't think in a real world scenario, students are going to take a you know, preponderance, kind of take a predominant priority for, for the doctor. So it's important for us to understand what the patient is uh, or, or, or who the patient is, how they are. Are they cooperative? Are we, are we seeing a patient who is, who is very sick? Do you think the patient would, would kind of spare some time uh, letting the students to come and see the patient or examine the patient? Do you think the teaching can be done with the patient inside the clinic or with the patient after the patient leaves the clinic? Do we know their disease? Do we know their condition? That is, do you see the patient in, a, in an emergency setting or in an a &E where you really can't control which patients you're going to see? Or it's going to be a walk-in or it's going to be like an appointment system where, you, where we know what patients we are going to see. Think about these questions. I'm going to give you one example. This is one of the cases from UVI, it is, uh, sorry, from, from Moofields. Uh, so as a teaching fellow, uh, this is from AE, accident, accident and emergency. So when I'm teaching students in my AE, uh, as a teaching fellow, I have the luxury, I have the, I have the privilege of picking the appropriate patients who can help the students to learn from his or her condition. So this one such case sheet, the patient has a right eye, redness, pain, photophobia, blurry vision, and the patient has a past history of uveitis. So all these things would have been written by the nurse. So now I have an idea that this patient would be an appropriate patient for the students to be taught. So this patient can be the ideal candidate, uh, an ideal patient who will fit into the curriculum requirements of the student because acute red eye is an important topic for an undergraduate, for a postgraduate, for, for anybody for that matter. Look at this picture. This is another case sheet from my genetics clinic. So we have uh, one of the busiest genetics clinic in, in England. Uh, the fellows, the students, the trainees are provided with a list of the patients who we will be seeing the day before, right? So this thing has all the details. It has the patient's name and all the details, and it sees it's a, it's a new patient or follow patient, the diagnosis, what is going to be the next plan. So we have a big discussion happening even before the clinic. We sit and discuss, I'm going to see these 15, 20 patients tomorrow. So let's discuss how these patients are. So what happens, a, a bit of a discussion teaching happens before the clinic. And once the clinic ends, the fellows all get together. And then again, we have a discussion. So the teaching doesn't really happen when the patient is there, but rather it happens before and after the clinic. But by the end of the day, teaching happens. This is a much planned, much structured way of teaching. So such a terrific teaching opportunity, such a terrific learning experience or ambience for the students. Do you think this can be possible in your practice? Let's think about that. So 
the result is understanding the student and the patient is going to be the key. Knowing who the audience is going to be the key. And when that audience, when we know why we are doing what we are doing, who the audience is going to be, then the what gets covered. We know what to teach when, when the purpose, when the audience are going to be clear. And let's move on to the techniques or how do we teach a student in a busy clinic? The methods. Now, currently, I'm a clinical teaching fellow at Moofields, which means a big part of my role is to teach. So uh, I don't expect you to be clinical teaching fellows in your practice. You will be the clinicians, you'll be busy practitioners, you'll be seeing many patients per day. And I was like you. Seven for, for, for almost seven to 10 years, I was working in one of the busiest hospitals in the world called Aravindai Hospital in South India, where we see around 1,500 patients in one center in a day. So every doctor, irrespective of the position, be it a resident or be it a, be it a consultant, you are supposed to see at least 60 patients, six zero to, seven, to 80 patients per day. So do you think you can teach with when you are supposed to see 60 patients per day? It's, 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 it's humanly impossible. But we still, we try to make some strategies. How can we give an experience, a learning experience for the junior learners? The first strategy is this. It's called as see and correct. Now, we have uh, the student who is going to be, the resident who is going to be in a preliminary station. So patient one will be undergoing the visual acuity or refraction. The patient comes to the resident or the learner. And now the resident is going to examine the patient either by slit lamp or torchlight, get history, do the preliminary workup. And now the student is going to bring the patient to me, the consultant. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the patient, examine the patient again, and I'm going to correct the student. This is a very common scenario which we which we will definitely have in any teaching institution for that matter. The C and correct is, is going to be a very primitive model, actually. But the C and correct can be modified into an excellent learning opportunity for the students by expanding this into a one-minute preceptor. What is this one-minute preceptor? which means you're like a one minute manager. There's a book called One Minute Manager. Like that, you're going to be like a one minute preceptor. Preceptor means teacher. You are the preceptor. So how can we teach the students with the patient there within a minute and also give lots of other experiences as well? This one minute preceptor is going to be like a framework. It's a framework which helps us to teach the students in less than a minute. It involves five steps. Commit. Get a commitment from the student. What do you think is the probable diagnosis? Second, reason. Ask, why do you think that is the diagnosis? What is the rationale? Get the scientific reason behind that. And reinforce. Appreciate the right findings the student has found or student has made. Rectify. Gently correct the mistakes of the student without being harsh, without being very critical. Finally, teach them. Tell them one important take-home pearl or a take-home message. So all these things, C, 3, R, commit, reason, reinforce, rectify, and teach. All these five micro skills happen under a minute. Now, this can be under a minute. This can be two or three minutes. That's fine. But what I mean is all these important concepts, all these important teaching facilities are kind of condensed into a very easy to understand framework via one minute preceptor model. So now we have a student who brings me this patient who has an acute red eye. So now I'm asking, Okay, it's an acute red eye. The patient says the patient is going to have defective vision, uh, pain, redness, photophobia. Now I'm asking, okay, what is your commitment? What is your diagnosis? Or please give me a differential diagnosis. The patient says, um, yeah, it can be uh, a, an acute anterior an acute ankylosis glaucoma, acute keratitis, but I think it is acute keratitis or a corneal ulcer. And I ask her, why do you say so? What is the rationale? She says, the patient uh, has used contact lens uh, following which the patient had an acute red eye. Now I reinforce the fact that she asked for contact lens history. I say, excellent, great work. I really appreciate that you asked for history of contact lens, which is very important in these patients. But I'm saying, did you stain the cornea with fluorescent and saw the margins of the ulcers? She says, no, I did not. I say, it is important for you to stain the cornea with fluorescent dye. So now I've given her, a, corrected it, and I've, I've taught her something. And finally, I teach her that a patient uh, who is going to have using a contaminated contact lens, they can be more at risk for acanthemia keratitis. It's a devastating thing. I say that a patient is going to swim with contact lens on, who is going to shower with contact lens on, who is going to sleep with contact lens on. The three S's, they are at risk for getting an acanthemia induced contact lens 
keratitis or contact lens induced keratitis. So I've, now I've given her a teaching point as well. This is called an efficient teaching. Now this saves time and it gives an optimal learning opportunities for the student as well. This is one example of how we can adopt this one minute preceptor model in our daily clinical practice. Now please watch this video. Uh, this is a 56-year-old gentleman. Um, he's got a, a no real significant past ocular history. He does wear glasses, though. It seems kind of thick. Um, he's complaining about a one-week history of having these flashes of light. Um, he says in the past he's had some floaters before, but nothing like this. Lots of flashes of light. Which flashes is and floaters? Him. Right. Flashes and floaters for him. Um, okay. Why don't we just go in and we'll oh, take a look at it. Sure. Okay. okay. Well, the, um, the medical student told me that you were having some new onset of flashes and floaters. How long have you had those? About a week. About a week. And up until that time, everything was fine? Mm-hmm. Okay. Have you noticed any change in your vision or your visual fields? Okay. Well, everything checks out really well. Uh, fortunately, I don't see any evidence of retinal tear or detachment. Uh, this is just a posterior vitreous separation, which is somewhat of a normal aging phenomenon. The good news is most people do really well without any risk of blah 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 but uh, I don't think that's going to happen. I think you're going to do real well. Do you have any questions at all? So what are your thoughts on that? Do you think uh, the doctor did any of these? Please put your thoughts in the Q&A box. Your comments on that particular scenario. While the answers come in, um, uh, are you able to get into the Q and A box? And uh, no, Doctor Eduardo, uh, I've hidden the floating controls. I'm trying to find a way to bring it back. If you can, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for that. Do we have one any here? Yeah, one here says actually the attending offered a model to judge the case to the student. Right. So that when he went in, he showed me, she showed him what would be the, the procedure. Right. And so, uh, 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 one more. It has, says here, uh, not really. The student found the main symptoms, but there was no feedback from the attending whatsoever, sadly. Another right. one, um, also, but not discussing directly with the student. This is a, a second part of the one that said the attended offered the model, but not discussing directly with the student. Okay, yes. Excellent, excellent observation. So like you said, again, a busy doctor uh, who doesn't have the time to get a commitment from the student and he doesn't have time to listen to the student as well. And you can see that there was a very monotonous interaction between the student, uh, sorry, between the teacher and the and the patient, uh, the doctor and the patient, and the student was totally neglected. He was like treated as not there. He's like invisible there, just quite a common scenario. Many of my students give me this feedback saying that uh, the doctors don't, see us at all they don't acknowledge us at all just which is a very difficult feeling for any student we have been through that and and it's important for us that we should not reciprocate that thing to the next generation of students that's going to be the whole philosophy now please look at this video okay this is a 56 year old gentleman he has a one-week history of these uh, flashes of light that came on all of a sudden he says he has no pain with these um, but they just come and go throughout the day, uh, night and day as well. Um, his only past uh, uh, experience that he's had is just some floaters, 
but never had any flashes of light like this. As far as, far as his past ocular history, he wears some pretty thick glasses, but that's really about all. Um, past medical history is unremarkable. His family history is significant for brothers who had a retinal detachment in the past. Um, so it sounds like he was doing very well and then suddenly noticed the flashes and floaters? Right, right. And then the other feature was that they were different from his baseline floaters? Right, exactly. There's many more of them. Okay. What did you find on exam? On, on exam, his pupils reacted normally. They were normal. Um, his confrontational visual field was normal as well. Uh, on the slit lamp, uh, nothing seemed too abnormal. His corneas appeared clear. Uh, his lens appeared clear as well. And I didn't see anything too, uh, uh, too crazy in there. Okay. So we have a 56-year-old gentleman who complains of a sudden onset of flashes and floaters. I know you're new to ophthalmology, but do you have any feeling for what, what could be causing that? Well, I've always heard that with flashes of light, you have to be kind of worried about a retinal detachment. Okay, great. Are there any features about his history that might contribute to a retinal detachment? Um, he does wear some pretty thick glasses. Okay, and that's true. People who are nearsighted may have an increased risk of retinal detachment. How'd you make out with the exam? I think pretty good. Okay, pretty good. good. All right, let's go in together. We'll get some more history, and then I want to have you demonstrate the exam for me. Okay. Great. Good. Hey, Mr. Jones. Hey, hey Quillen. Nice to meet you. Sounds like you got a pretty good workout with Dallin. Yes, very thorough exam. Good. Yeah, he's doing a great job on the service. If it's okay with you, I'd like Alan to show me some of his examination skills. That would be fun. Okay, why don't you go ahead and do the sit lamp, and let's okay. see how you do with that. Okay, so the good news is everything checks out well. Don't see any evidence of retinal tear or detachment. I think you're going to do well with this. Now, it's real important over the next few weeks to keep an eye on those flashes and floaters. And if anything changes, we want to hear from you right away. Okay. Okay, Alan, do you have any thoughts about... Um, how the posterior vitreous separation can cause a retinal tear or a retinal detachment? Well, I guess it is touching it. Um, so maybe there can be some areas where it sticks to the retina. It can maybe pull on the retina some. That's exactly right. What happens is in certain areas, the vitreous has a strong attachment to the retina. And as that vitreous separates, it can pull. And if it pulls hard enough, it can pull a tear. Real important point is anyone with new onset of flashes and floaters, you want to have them come in for an examination right away. And that examination needs to include dilation. Excellent. Now you can look at a very contrasting video here. What are your thoughts now? What do you think has, do you think things have been improved, things have got worse, and what things have changed? So again, refer to this one minute preceptor. Do you think these five micro skills were accomplished by the doctor when he was teaching the student. You can put your comments in the Q&A box, please. So, Dr. Edward, if you can kind enough, be kind of let me know about the options. Thank you so much. I will, as soon as they come in. Okay. Uh, it says, much more didactical approach, the take-home message, very important. Another mm -hmm. one, the student was, the student was given <clears throat> the opportunity to suggest a diagnosis and also to interact more with a patient. <clears throat> much more didactical approach, the take-home message, very important. Everything improved. This time the doctor discussed further with the student. Nice teaching demo, another one. He also elaborated each of the symptoms with the student. The attending also supervised the student while examining the patient. They also discussed the case and draw conclusions together and made some key points so that the resident got the most out of their time in the clinic. That's a great, great point. So uh, uh, what is the name of the uh, the participant who gave that the elaborate answer? Dr. The last one, uh, Dr. Antonia Elena Ranet. Thank you so much, Dr. Antonia. It's like a very elaborate, very good observation you have made. And the other uh, participants who, who take the trouble, who took the trouble to kind of answer all these things. You are, you are absolutely right. So now here, 
the, the doctor has kind of accomplished all these five. He got a commitment. He got a reason why the diagnosis is. He reinforced the right things, what he did. He rectified. He didn't really, not much of rectification, but, but he really engaged uh, with the patient as well as with the the student that's the important thing actually you can look at this the teacher kind of goes back and forth between the patient and the student so most often uh, in our daily practice the patients do appreciate it one of the challenges what you guys have told me is that the patient would be kind of insecure confidentiality and all those reasons could be one of the major factors might deter us from from kind of teaching a student in a busy clinic but if you're going to look at it the patients do really appreciate it what i do is whenever i uh, examine the patient. I will tell the patient that I have some students with us. So while I'm examining, I will also explain the student what's happening. So that you also can understand your disease better. So patients do accept that when I'm teaching a student, I'm also teaching the patient as well. That's a beautiful scenario happening. There. It's like a symbiosis there. So you are giving a very good counseling for the patient and also you are explaining the terms to the student as well. So you need to kind of uh, balance are, are words, choice of words, not to give two technical terms for the patient, but you can use that for the student and also come switch back and forth like this between the teacher and the patient to give the best possible uh, health experience or a treated experience for the patient, also a learning experience for the student as well. Now, we have covered the C and correct model. I will go to another model in a very brief way, but I'll, I'm going to give these much more practical tips. The second model is called as a show and tell, which means this is another scenario where you will commonly come across. You will have students who are with us always. They can be either somewhere else. We will call them. Uh, the difference is in this scenario, in, in the show and tell model, we will be the first point of contact. The doctors will be the first point of contact for the patient. So the patient comes to us and then we going to show or demonstrate the findings, clinical signs on the patient. And then we are showing to the student simultaneously or after we have seen. This is the second common scenario what we commonly use, the show and tell model. Now, how do I show and tell in my practice? So at Moofields, we have the facility of having a video slit lamp. So while the doctor sees the patients, we have the direct observation of looking at the anterior segment, even the fundus examination can be well uh, can be done simultaneously. So the students are seeing what I'm seeing. So there's no waste of time there. But this is a costly venture. You need to have enough funding to get a big machine like this, a slit lamp with, with the video attachment. But what I do is, uh, we are using this again at, you know, at Moofields. Uh, we got an adapter, a smartphone adapter, where you can attach your cell phone, your, your, your mobile phones to this adapter. This is a beautiful adapter. This, this is quite brilliant. This is very different from the ones what I used in India. The ones which I got in India just moves up, down, and it also moves right and left. But this one is a three axis. It moves to and fro as well. Okay. And this is available on, on Amazon. It, it costs 50 pounds, but it is completely worth it. You may find it on your Amazon stores as well. So please look for this three axis universal smartphone adapter. So what I do is uh, I use a phone. I all uh, I still use an iPhone 5. Now we have 15. So I use a specific iPhone 5. It's a very old phone, but it it, it does just uh, you know it, it does the job you know job beautifully. It, it gives the clarity what I needed. And uh, if you if you really want to fancy a better clarity, get an iPhone SE. So the point is you should have only one camera, a single camera. You should not have, have these four or three cameras like what we have in these newer iPhone models. So put this phone onto the adapter and you can look at this clarity of the image. You, you want the video of your eye? Mm. So I'm focusing. So I use this to demonstrate patients, even to teach slit lamp skills to a medical student uh, or, a, or a beginner trainee, I use this adapter, I teach them. Not just with the anterior segment, you can also take beautiful uh, images or you can take a video of the uh, discs as well, the posterior segment. Uh, the, you, you see the red, that's oh, gonna yeah, be. Yeah. You see that circle? Yeah. That's gonna be this. Everyone saw? Yeah. yeah. So this is gonna be the macula, which is kind of dark. I'm not shining because it'll be more photophobic for him. This is gonna be the disc. Appreciate that disc. Look at the cup. He's having a healthy cup. 
CDRS. Yeah. So now uh, you are saving the time, right? Uh, you are only seeing the patient, but the student also learns from what you're seeing simultaneously. What I do is I can easily mirror my iPhone image or the iPhone video to a computer, to a laptop. So many audience can see simultaneously. While, while doing a split lamp skill examination for the students, I take this split lamp to the lecture theater. I connect this laptop to a bigger screen. I even make a demonstration. I mean, the, the possibilities are endless. So this is one tip which I want to give when you want to go for this show and tell approach where you really can show the findings easily uh, to a larger group of audience in your clinic. But one, one problem, what, what we all commonly face is that, like you saw in that bad video, you can see the student was kind of uh, disconnected. He was looking at his watch, looking at his phone. Technology is is hazardous these days, and we have very distracted students. And uh, uh, I don't think that's that that's something which you have to worry about. Use the technology to our advantage. So what I do is, uh, whenever I am seeing the patient, I'm going to type the the notes for the patient. I'm going to explain to the patient. So there will be some time where students don't really have to listen to what I'm doing or seeing what I'm doing, but still I want them to be engaged. So what I do is, I give them a mind map. So I make these mind maps for the students. I give them beforehand or I, I put them on a website. I, I share with them when they come to the clinic. Now, these mind maps will have all the differential diagnosis for acute red eye. So when I give these mind maps to them, I will say, now read about the other signs. So now they're engaged. They're using a phone. They're using their iPad. They're using technology. They're using a screen, but they're learning now. But forget about all the technology. If you ask me what is the most effective teaching tool which can be used in our clinic, that's going to be a simple, plain whiteboard. Okay, This is one of my cubicles where I see patients and I still have a whiteboard. This was the cubicle which I used at Aravind, but I don't see any whiteboards at Moorfields, but uh, still the whiteboard is in. Whiteboard is a brilliant, brilliant piece of uh, tool for teaching, actually. You can see like a canvas to be painted. The, the, the whiteboard is imprinted with concepts and teaching was made much, much better. I even make diagrams uh, to teach, to explain health education concepts to my patients. So whiteboard is such a versatile tool, not just to teach students, but also to promote health awareness for the patients as well. And this is my cubicle. So someone said space is a constraint, but in fact, you can optimize the space. This is the space where I teach. So what I do, my classes happen within that space. I take classes. I bring in a glaucoma expert to, to kind of moderate a presentation made by my students, my residents. I get a small uh, mobile projector. I can connect to the laptop and I can even use the whiteboard as a projector screen as well. So it's all about your imagination, your creativity, how, how much you want to. Even if you can't get a whiteboard, you can get these uh, sticky tapes, uh, sticky whiteboards. You can stick on the cubicle walls. You can still teach. So what I mean is, uh, it's it's not about the constraints or challenge. It's about the willingness to teach, finding the best possible way to give the best possible teaching experience for our student. So I'm going to end with this. I'm going to come back to the first question. Why should we teach in a busy clinic? Right. But to be honest, it's not about why should we teach in a busy clinic. It's about why should we teach in the first place? Why are we teaching? Do we teach because someone has asked us to or it's a part of the job? Or do we teach because we love the process of teaching? Do we want to build a stronger generation of doctors for the future? Think about that. The second question, who are we teaching? We also talked, uh, talked about the second, who are we teaching? Again, it's not about who are we teaching, but who are we? Are we just doctors who treat patients? Are we doctors who don't just treat, but we are medical educators who also teach? So are we a teacher or just a treater? It's a nice word, treater. It's not a surprise that a doctor is a teacher because the word doctor itself is derived from teaching. So that ends this, this uh, long talk on teaching in a busy clinic. Thank you so much for interaction, your patients. Uh, I really appreciate the audience who staying connected, interacting through Q&A polls. This is where I put my videos on how to teach. So you can access the mind maps, which I shared, because I feel that uh, we have residents who are a part of the audience. You can get the mind maps, you can get the videos, theories, and also there's a playlist 
that I made specifically for teaching, which you can access for more understanding. So again, thank you so much for, for the opportunity uh, and the patient listening. Let us all teach to reach.